Welcome everybody who's just joined. Uh, we are going to be getting started here. Uh, and thank you all for coming. And as you know, this is Summer Session 2020, our first ever virtual summer session. So if this is your first session to join, we are thrilled to have you. And uh, this is specifically going to be an alumni session on leadership coaching. And I know some of you are also potential students. So welcome all of our potential students in addition to our alums. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Terry Hildebrandt. I am uh, an alum of the Evidence-Based Coaching Program and also the Human and Organizational Development PhD Program. Today, um, I'm gonna kick us off with some brief um, overview of what we're gonna be covering. So Louise, if you could go to slide three. Okay, so this is our agenda for today. Uh, we have two major sections in today's uh, agenda. The first will be some brief 10 minute overviews of some hot topics uh, that are really, uh, I think, uh, cutting edge work that's being done in the coaching space globally. Uh, we will have, uh, I'll be kicking it off with talking about coaching supervision. And then our uh, colleague Rick will be talking about cultural competency learnings uh, from the Co-Generations Project with some hot off the presses learnings from his morning session, as well as some additional work that's been going on. Uh, Louise is going to be talking about leadership coaching for MBAs. And this is a really important topic. Many MBA schools are beginning to incorporate coaching as part of one of their core learning strategies. So she'll be talking about what's going on at Tufts uh, University. And then Judith will kick us off with a, a very exciting experiential exercise. And I'm gonna leave it a bit uh, mysterious uh, and let her uh, jump right into it. But it's, we uh, heard all about it yesterday. I'm very excited about what Judith is gonna be doing for all of us. Then we will transition uh, to breakout discussions, which will be really more of a networking opportunity. And, uh, and uh, Louise will kick us off there. And then at the very end, I'll just wrap up with some closing remarks as well as an invitation for all of you to stay connected with us uh, going forward. So let's begin. So if you go to the next slide, Louise, there we go. So my um, brief 10 minute update today is really about coaching supervision. And I do have some slides that I'm gonna share with you. Uh, so give me just a moment while I bring those up on the screen here. So I would love to just hear from all of you and uh, who has heard about coaching supervision uh, before. And if you have, just put a, a little note in the chat room. So we do have chat available for this particular uh, event. Um, if someone could kick us off uh, if you've heard about supervision. Okay, it looks like we, quite a few people have. So I'm gonna be sharing with you, and, and by the way, we are we recording? I just wanted to verify, because I think we wanted to record today's session. Okay, all right, excellent. You guys are on top of it. Uh, so let me begin my slideshow. This is gonna be a, a very brief overview of what's going on in the world of supervision and how important it is uh, for coaches. And uh, the uh, basic overview is what uh, a definition some research that uh, I recently did and it's been published, some study findings from that research, and then hopefully a, a couple minutes for a Q&A. So we've already talked about uh, who has seen supervision. I'm also wondering how many of you uh, are uh, currently involved in supervision where you have an active supervision relationship. If you are, wave your hand just so we can see on the screen how many people uh, are actively being supervised. Not too many. Uh, any, any supervisors in the room, folks that are actually trained supervisors and are delivering supervision, if that's the case for you, kind of raise your hand and, and wave a little bit so we can see. Uh, not a lot of supervisors here. Uh, and how many people are brand new to supervision? This is your first experience with it. A few of you? Okay, great. So supervision is, um, 
uh, something that has been around in Europe for about 10 years and is relatively new to the US. And you'll notice here that I've put a dash between the words super and vision. And that's done purposely because it really is not about traditional management or, or a, a mentor slash apprentice relationship, which is what we typically think of when we think of supervision. In this case, we're really talking about a reflective practice. And here is the definition of the European Mentoring and, and Coaching Council. And they've been a, really a leader in defining and also uh, certifying supervision. And you can see the definition here that it's an interaction that occurs when a mentor or a coach, you can have a, a supervisor for mentors or a supervision, supervision for coaching, um, where you bring your work experience to a, a supervisor to be supported and to engage in reflective dialogue and collaborative learning. So the goal is uh, really all about um, learning and looking at case studies primarily. And if we look at some of the, the core purposes uh, of supervision, they describe it uh, with, with the EMCC as a developmental function, where you're really about uh, understanding the capacities of the coach, uh, a resourcing function, which is a supporting the experiences that they have had with working with clients. These are mainly about looking at client case studies that might have been giving you trouble um, or that you want to be more creative and working with your clients. And then also the qualitative function, which is more about ethics and quality. And a lot of organizations now in Europe require all of their coaches to actually be in active supervision. In other words, they, they have, those coaches have hired supervisors and they're paying their supervisor to actually uh, work with them to ensure high quality coaching. Um, the ICF uh, also defines supervision as part of the ongoing practice for professional development of coaches. And these, just some of the distinctions between these various concepts. Uh, coaching supervision, again, is about reflective dialogue for collaborative learning and development. Where coaching, as you know, is really about helping coaching clients achieve their objectives uh, through um, self-awareness and goal setting and planning and mindset changes. Mentoring is more about sharing knowledge and expertise. And then mentor coaching for an ICF credential, which is what most people in the US are familiar with, uh, is really about developing your core competencies as defined by the ICF when you are uh, attempting to go after an ACC or PCC or MCC. Uh, there has been a lot of confusion in the past uh, between what is a mentor coach versus a supervisor, and these are how they're currently being distinguished um, out in the world. When we did some research about a year ago, a, a group of colleagues of mine who had all gone through coaching supervision certification training with Damien Goldvarg about three years ago, uh, Kim C., Lillian, Mary Jo, and myself, um, we decided we wanted to understand what is the global state of supervision. Uh, and we ended up um, discovering through our research with over 1,280 participants, mostly in the leadership coaching space, um, but also in other, other types of coaches, that supervision is still relatively new uh, in the U.S. And these were uh, how we were looking at supervision across the world. So we actually had a very global study. It was the largest global study of what's going on in supervision done to date. Uh, and some of the current findings uh, that came out of this study is that, you know, we are definitely seeing more supervision happening in Europe. Uh, at Europe right now, about 57% of all coaches in Europe and uh, Africa have active supervisors. Um, and in APAC, uh, about 38% of those folks are currently working with the supervisor, while only 20% of the folks in the US. So you can see the US is far behind uh, the rest of, of the world here. And uh, we also looked at group supervision, uh, similar patterns there, where it's much more popular in Europe and APAC compared to the Americas. Uh, you can also see here that some of the folks said that they had had supervision but only while they were being trained as coaches, 
So you see in the US that was much more common. Uh, this is also why we believe they were not likely actually being supervised. They were more likely uh, in mentor coaching. And some of the current programs in the US describe and uh, confuse mentor coaching and supervision and use the word supervision uh, interchangeably for mentor coaching as defined by the ICF. So you can see it's unlikely that actually 40% of folks in the US have actually uh, experienced supervision since it's relatively new. We also found that <clears throat> the most common <clears throat> frequency of supervision is monthly, uh, followed by uh, every other month or once a quarter. And this is largely due to the EMCC requires uh, for their certification programs uh, that you have active supervision to remain as a credentialed coach. And they require it at least uh, four times a year or 35, um, every 35 hours of cl client time should be one hour of supervision. These are some of the topics that people discovered uh, during uh, supervision that they brought to the table. And you can see the top three were client related issues and challenges, you know, what I call tough coaching situations or clients, uh, and then followed by personal challenges that they may be dealing with as, as a coach, and then their own skills and competencies. Some of the benefits were working through client challenges, being able to get greater clarity, uh, working on developing coaching skills, uh, learning from their supervisor's experience, developing confidence, and working through a personal challenge. These are some of the open-ended questions and there where we did qualitative analysis uh, to find out what they found as the core value of supervision. New perspectives was number one, followed by the opportunity for personal development, uh, space and time to reflect and support. And then lastly, reassurance. Um, that uh, about their coaching. We also asked about fees, you know, what does it cost to, to have a supervisor? The midpoint was about $150 per hour, although we did see some differences between uh, geographic uh, regions. Uh, America was slightly more expensive, around $204 an hour, uh, along with the Caribbean, where the United Kingdom and other parts of Europe were a little bit lower around that 176 uh, range. Group supervision was uh, also uh, a little bit cheaper. You could see $141 an hour in the Americas and Europe ranging around that 100 to 112 uh, an hour for group supervision. I'm gonna also just talk about how most people find their supervisor is through personal prior experience or through a professional uh, association or referral. And if you would like to learn more about supervision, in our recent book, hopefully you heard about it, Innovations in Leadership Coaching Research and Practice. This is a fielding book that just came out in May of this year, so it's a, only about two months old. Um, one of the chapters uh, in this book is on uh, supervision, so I highly recommend you checking that out. Um, we also did a launch webinar as part of the book launch that is recorded and on Fielding's website. And you can go and listen to that and learn more about our book. Uh, there's also a research report with a lot more details. And then my own personal website has a lot of great information about supervision and links to various articles and uh, book chapters. So we hope you will uh, enjoy learning more about supervision. It'll become more and more prevalent as we go forward in the next uh, a few years. And by the way, Fielding includes coaching supervision as part of our coach training program and have for several years. So I think we are probably out of time for comments and questions. I just wanna keep us moving. And, uh, and if we can bring up the slides uh, again uh, at this point, Louise. And you're on mute, so we can't hear you. I know you're talking, but we can't hear you, Louise. Just toggling back, just trying to get the right slides up there on the screen. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, you, should, you should see Rick's 
Yep, we're good. We see it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to uh, now hand it over to uh, Rick, and he's going to be talking about the Code Generations project. Thanks, Terry, and thanks for your presentation. Um, I do want to put a slide up, so I think I can just share screen now and do that. Right. So um, I just opened up. There we go. So we're going to talk about the Code Generations Project. And can you see that all right? Yes. OK. So um, as was mentioned, we just had a session this morning a few hours ago. And I was going through the list of uh, participants for this session. And it looks like there are five of the participants on this session that were also on the session this morning about Code Generations. So uh, I know Terry, and I didn't realize you had joined, but thanks, Terry, for participating this morning, and uh, uh, Ann Ritter, Karen Bunnell, Kathleen Kern, and Tsitsi Watt, I believe, were also there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Code Generation Project, which is just evolving. It's very new. You can see that it just started in April. Um, that was when my previous job of running Global Service Corps, which could best be described as a mini Peace Corps for adults that I've been doing for the last 27 years, actually, since I finished my, I finished my master's degree. I, I interrupted my doctoral program because I got so involved in this little participatory action research project, what it ended up being, and I'm still doing it 27 years later. So I don't know if I'll ever turn this into a dissertation, but um, the key issue there is that fielding was central in helping me get this started through uh, advice of uh, fielding faculty member, and also students who were involved in international work. So fast forward to April or March when COVID made it very evident that we had to shut down our Global Service Corps program in Cambodia. I started thinking about the fact that for the past 27 years, I mainly worked with young people aged 18 to 30 and got to know them and respected them. These were service learning type people that really were wonderful volunteers. And all my life, I have been concerned and interested in the fact that our, our society does not seem to honor or appreciate or take advantage of the wisdom and the expertise and experience of our elders. And I started thinking about what's going on in our world today, and we all know we're we're in the middle of potentially vast societal changes and with the recent protests with a lot of young people participating as well as um, middle-aged and older people, um, there's some concerns out there, not only about racial injustice and police brutality, but really about the overall direction of our country and our society, getting even into the question of, you know, is our health system broken? Is our government doing what it's supposed to be doing? So. I started thinking more and more about how could those of us that are in an older generation actually assist in this whole process. And I agree with President Obama that it's really time to pass the leadership of our society onto the younger generation. So how is that going to happen and, and how are we as the older generation going to help? So. Um, We've, we had some initial conversations in April with Tim Stanton is a, a fielding PhD and a, probably the country, if not the world expert on service learning. Rick Moody, you may know his name. He's a faculty member here, adjunct faculty. Connie Corley, Keith Melville are, all, are also faculty members. Uh, Peter Whitehouse is a very involved PhD MD faculty at three different universities, including Oxford. And then we also met with a couple of actually three, what we call uh, young adult advisors. So that brought us, and, and during those sessions, we all agreed that we really need to get some more data. And the data that we wanted was to find out more what young people were thinking. So what we did was we put together a group of questions and we asked people to interview young people. Um, by young people, we were suggesting anywhere between 18 and 30, um, trying to identify possibly what generation they were a member of, or even if they were interested in being identified as a generational member, um, what are their concerns, 
what would an activity of dialogue and mutual mentoring and engagement with members of other generation be useful? Um, if so, um, what would what kind of input would you be open to from older generations? Um, and what kind of input would you be willing to share with other older generation folks? And if so, how might we work together? So we had, I think, about um, close to 10 or 12 people who attended this session. We went into breakout rooms and we basically discussed two of these main areas of interest. Um, one being, what are the young people thinking is the problem? And two, how might we work together? And I, I would like to do this, if, if those of you that are attending both sessions don't mind. Um, I have my perspective as a presenter, but I'd really be interested in hearing what some of you who attended actually experienced and any ideas you had. Um, not so much qualitatively, was it useful or not, but really my question is, do you think this whole cogeneration project is a viable idea? Do you think young people are interested? And do you think people of your generation and particularly yourself would be interested in being involved? So Terry, I know you're a experienced a presenter and we'll have no problem just answering those questions. So why don't we start with you if you wouldn't mind giving your thoughts about the whole idea and what happened this morning. I can't unmute you. I guess you have to unmute yourself. Go. So you're not talking about Terry Hildebrandt because I was not there. <laughs> so oh, I assume really? you're talk I'm thinking, assume you're talking about someone else in the room. Really? I, the list showed you there. Okay, that's fine. So let's go to Karen Bunnell. Karen, would you mind talking a little bit about your, your thoughts about this uh, experience this morning and more specifically about what what you think young people are interested in and might they be interested in this whole idea of collaboration with older folks? Okay, um, I'm happy to share what I, what I recall anyway in terms of how it might be of interest to this group. Um, one of the things that jumped out at me is there, there actually seemed to me from the interview data that various people shared that there's some resistance actually to a um, couple of things. One of them is being labeled as coming from a particular generation. I, uh, I don't want to be a millennial. I don't want to be pigeonholed. Number two, some resistance to uh, actually talking with older people. And not from every young person, but there, that was an interesting find for me. Uh, and then we, uh, at least in my small group, and I think to some extent in the larger group, we were talking about well, how might we bridge that gap. And I think one of the things that stuck out was the younger generation really wants to know that the older generation cares and that the, young, that the older generation understands and acknowledges that what, what they are, how they are living and what they've experienced um, is different than ours. And something that we will not necessarily understand. So collaborative, um, respectful dialogue, whether it be through appreciative inquiry or, or whatever techniques um, need to be utilized to bridge some of this gap, especially if some of the, the younger uh, interested generation is, is resistant to talking to the older ones. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, those are issues that have been coming up for sure. Um, how about Titsi? Would you like to say something about your thoughts of this whole idea? Sorry, I actually missed the session this morning. Oh, okay. So I, I don't have my data quite right here. So why don't we go on to, um, is Kathleen Curran on? Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, I'm here. And um, were you? Were you in the morning I, session? I was, That's I right. was. Um, I think a couple of points stand out that would be of interest for a bunch of coaches here. Um, two things. One, there was a sense of time that um, there's so much to connect on and so little time. But then we, we realized with the people who had 
who were of a younger generation, let's say around 30, and then they had access, they taught um, younger than that, um, that we, we all think of different things in a different sense of urgency. Um, certain topics like uh, rights and uh, less about climate, but about justice, that was something that was more urgent to a younger generation than older, yet um, the, the view on time basically was the, the different thing. So that would be a very interesting thing. I'm thinking again with the coach's hat on, that, that that's a real generational difference is how we think about time and how much we feel we have and how, how, much, how urgent we feel. But the other one that's really interesting was um, that it was expressed that the younger generation recognizes that the older group has um, more contacts, has a network, has access to things that they may not have, whether it's experience or just uh, facilities or something. And they want, they would appreciate the older generation to facilitate knocking the doors down. And so I think also with respect to a coaching perspective to say, how do we facilitate knocking the doors down that would open up how we connect and uh, have a two-way street is something that, that came out in this group this morning. All right, thank you. And is Anne, Anne Ritter on the line? I am here however if you all remember i had to leave early so i'm afraid everyone has pretty much expressed um kind of where i had to step off that you know i i really wish that i had had more time to spend in my interview to talk to um, my subject and say well what would you like to come tell us because he declined my invitation to come to the meeting today. It was, it was kind of like he wasn't interested. Um, in right, talking. you were the one that actually did an interview, so do you want right. to add, add anything to what you've heard thus far, what came out of your interview? No, you know, other than that, I was disappointed that he didn't seem more interested in engaging with us. He said that, you know, he felt like the, the greatest possibility lay in peer-to-peer -peer influence, and that he should continue working with people around his same age group and younger um, who didn't see eye to eye with him, you know, on, on the environment and climate change and social justice and racial justice. And that older people should try to work with their peer group, um, uh, particularly in the areas of, of voting and voting rights and um, racial, racial justice. So that's, that's where he felt like it needed to be. Right, well, thank you very much. You can tell that there's a lot to discuss here. I think I've basically run out of my time, so I'm gonna leave it at that. I am going to, just in case anybody is interested in um, getting more information, I'm just gonna pop my uh, email address up. I think I've got the right screen here. Let me see here, no. You know what, I can send it out later if necessary, or put it, I'll put it on the chat room. In case you want any more information about this, we've gathered the note, we're gathering the notes from all the breakouts from about, I think there were about 40 people that we had input from. So if anybody are, is interested in this subject, I'd be happy to send you those notes and, and let you know um, what we might be doing in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rick, very much for your session. And um, I can put up here for just a second the information that you had on your email address, and then we can go ahead to the uh, remainder on the chat room. Could I just ask someone to confirm that you can see the screen? Yes, it's good. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, so far, so good. Terribly interesting uh, subjects. And I'll give us a change of pace. I'm, I'm going to switch to talking a bit about the program that I've been really happy to start at the, the Tuf, uh, Tufts University. And really just a quickie that uh, be, be aware that every time you do something for 
the Fielding University alumni, particularly in this case uh, for Hillary, that things can happen. So here's what happened to me. This is how Fielding makes things happen. Um, so the alumni summer program one year, I did it, my pilot study overview and had the opportunity with, with Hillary to record that in advance as a promo. That went online somewhere, who knows where in the universe that showed up, but someone at the Fletcher School of Leadership at Tufts happened to watch that and then got my dissertation and started looking at the way I recommended that we design educational programs for global leaders. So watch out what you ask for because things actually do happen. So my research area and my final dissertation was called the markers of successful global leaders and talked about what types of markers there are in the way a person approaches their leadership qualities and practices that could define how they got to be who they are in managing these extraordinarily complex roles in multinational organizations. So the Tufts program in global leadership picked up on my dissertation and invited me to help them design the program and in particular to use some new innovative forms of teaching and learning to help engage the entire person. And that was really the, the kind of front and center of my program is that global leadership is really a matter of identity. That once you are operating on a global scale, you are no longer defined by your country of origin necessarily as much as you are by all of the other uh, organizational things that you work on and where you happen to be located and what, what language you happen to be using for business. So the program now is a new online Master of Global Business Administration program targeted for working professionals. And so Fielding helped make this happen. So I thought I would share a little bit of the background um, because it leads up to a component on leadership coaching that is embedded. So the program is designed to help people take their past experiences into their developmental learning journey as a leader and help them gain insights into how they got to be strong in certain areas, where their global competencies came from, understand their character strengths and their own values, and help them really cultivate their ability to learn consistently from experiences. So to be fully present and to deeply listen to the people around them and to cultivate their mindfulness and learn to assess and continue to develop their cultural intelligence and also help others develop it. And also to help them understand how to read and interpret intercultural situations so they can adapt in, the, in those important ways. And then to really look at their entire well being as a human being, as an executive, as someone who is leading a large organization, that fundamentally they are the product of their leadership and that they need to, at an individual group and organizational level, provide sustainability as a leader. Hey, and, Louise? Yeah. Um, there's been a few people asked in the chat to move to a slideshow just to make it a little readable. Oh. Where did that go? But yes, absolutely. And I'll be happy to make these um, slides available as well. Sorry. Thank you Thank for you. that. And I'm gonna take off that extra little piece there. Okay, great. So is that a little bit better? Uh, it's, it's a little to the left now, if you can what? move it. Uh, yeah, you need to, there we go, that worked. Okay, all right, great. So uh, being able to uh, develop this whole person for an integrated life that will sustain their leadership no matter where they happen to be located in the world. And to really tie this all together, we've recommended that they add a piece on executive coaching. And so I just want to take you through what that's about. So I gave um, an interview to introduce them to all of this that talks about how leadership is relational how a global leader is developing their identity as a person and that global leadership skills are developed primarily on the job and that there are certain markers of people who have the potential for success 
And so uh, we'll go into just a couple of areas to kind of help you see whether or not people you know may have those markers. And so uh, the ways in which we look at what a global leader is, we use this 10 point scale. And it is uh, very interesting to note that when people are able to meet these criteria, they actually are truly able to function on a global level, which means primarily they could get off an airplane in any country and do business in that country successfully because they bring with them these types of qualities. And of course, there's much more to it. They have to have an identity where they consciously are aware and have cultural sensitivities. They um, need to be consciously aware of things they don't have and hope they don't have and look for feedback, whether or not they're developing in those undesirable areas or developing in the desirable areas. And they have an interest in being more integrated as a human being. And they're more aware of how dysfunction shows up if they should have that. And so in the final research that I did, these are the key areas that I would say are the markers of success for someone who has the potential to live and breathe and become a global leader. And it starts early in life and it then rolls all the way through their work ethic, the evidence of philanthropy, the stories that they tell about themselves and how they've figured out problems and a variety of other characteristics that um, if you have the opportunity to read my dissertation, you can learn more about. This is the uh, other thing I wanted to let all of you know about. If you have not published your dissertation, we have a colleague who helps us take our dissertations and get them up in an attractive way on Amazon. And so my dissertation has been published and will be part of this program um, at Tufts University. People have access to this so they can then follow along on the people that I researched and represented in my study and what they're learning in this program. So it's a really integrated program. Part three is where I come into this uh, MBA program and talk about leading across cultures and how to develop as a global leader and how to develop your cultural intelligence and how to leverage that and lead with that. And so the, the overall uh, program is kicking off this fall. It's our first opportunity at this. The coaching program that I've recommended is a series of three packages that would offer six hours, 13 hours, or 18 hours of executive coaching that would pick up from the time they get feedback in this program to being back on the job. In other words, a transitional type of coaching that will help them apply what they've learned on their everyday jobs. And so we're waiting right now to get this first cohort into the program and help them get to the point in the program where they've learned enough about what they have they don't want to have and learn where they want to develop strengths so that we hope that they'll be reaching out for executive coaching to help them mitigate some of those areas that they want to minimize and strengthen those areas that can help them be more successful. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. It's, um, it's kind of a if you will, a, a, a way that fielding helps alums in so many ways from publishing your dissertation to being offered an opportunity to present like we're doing today and to have somebody record that and pick that up that gives you an opportunity that in a million years you would never have imagined would happen. So I'm going to um, turn the program over now to Judith who has a very interesting way of pulling all of these things together and giving us an experience. So Judith, it's to you now. Thank you. Uh, I just have to find the slides. Okay. So um, how do I get these on here now? I, um, yeah, I'm going to stop sharing my, mine and then okay. if you then can pick up yours. Okay. It should, it should pick right up. Here it is. It's working. Good. Okay. And you were right. Uh, this does pull, it, pull kind of, it could pull everything together that I've heard so far. Because this is 
I guess in a way, um, what happens once you have all the skills? What, what happens when you really know what you're doing and you don't have to think about it and you don't have to prepare in the traditional way to work with students or work with coaches where you're just being present? So we're gonna call this deep listening. Um, this is a structured experience that um, I'll explain more as we go, but there, there are many ways to get to a certain level of knowing and wisdom. So one is more like this. This is a process. It's a, it's a patented process that I feel very grateful to have achieved. It starts with insight and it goes to um, personal responsibility. It goes to authenticity, integrity, clear mind and awakened action. And there's steps in there. There's uh, processes we've developed and exercises, for instance, in uh, Insight, we send people who are interested in this program to go to um, a coffee shop or a bar, whatever is possible in their world, and judge people. Everything we, that we've taught not to do, we ask them to do, not out loud, um, but inside, to, and write it down. What are their judgments of each person? They could be too fat, too this, too that judging them as being superior, inferior. And then we ask them to go back the next day and watch people judging them. And that's just the first, that's the first step in insight. And it, it, the results have been very interesting. I won't go into that now. And then if you have insight, you can be responsible for your behavior. Without insight, we find that you really are not able to be responsible. You could say you are, but it doesn't really go inside. And then authenticity. We show up as we are, not in our reactive self, but we just show up and we say what's true for us. And we don't think it's the truth. We think it's true for us at that moment. And then comes the most difficult part of this, integrity. It has no um, morality. It's just we mean what we say and we do what we say. And to me, that's been the most difficult personally, like I won't eat sugar. And then I say, well, just a little bit can't hurt or I'm making it very simple. And then once you get all those four and they're not in, in detail, like they're not in a straight line, but I presented them in a straight line. All of a sudden your mind is clear and there's nothing going on. There's absolutely nothing going on. You don't have to think about anything. And from that place, you can make awakened action decisions. So that's the traditional way we teach this, although some of our techniques are not so traditional. But then there's another way, which is we behave as we're birds flying through the sky, leaving no trace. And as you notice, birds fly in the sky and there's nothing there. It's like there's no thing there. And how do you access this space of clear mind and awakened action? Well, you do it from inside yourself. So I would like, if it's okay with everybody, to do a little exercise that might give us a moment of that. And that's called non-duality. It's a Buddhist, now here's the hard part, non-conceptual. It took me a year to have my husband understand what I was talking about non-conceptual, no concepts, no feelings, no thoughts, just nothing. And he said, well, then why do it? If there's nothing, why do it? So you might feel that way also, which is interesting, you'll see. So here's what we're going to do. This is the guided meditation. I'm going to remove this in a minute. I just wanted you to know what you're going to be doing so you don't feel, you feel at least not as uncomfortable as you might feel if you didn't know what you were going to be doing. So we're going to take a walk in the woods. We're going to clear the debris. We're going to pick a pattern in our lives that we have not been able to change. No matter what we've done, all the therapy, all the coaching, all the meditation, all the ashrams, all the spiritual journeys, it's still there. And we're going to, as we do that, 
we're going to look at a new way of looking at our early childhood points of view, our, our childhood conditioning, and then we're going to choose something very different, a new point of view, one that we haven't been willing to look at, and then look at this pattern that we identified a little earlier with this new point of view. And then just look at yourself. And we don't have time to share, I don't think, but that would be the next step is to share. Maybe in your breakout rooms, you'll be able to do some sharing of what you discovered. And um, we call this pure listening. And one of my teachers said, uh, pure listening is receiving what's communicated exactly as it is. Well, that's, think about that. You don't have anything to say. There's no thoughts. There's no... Oh, what she taught. There's nothing. That's pure listening. So as you go through this, do your best to purely listen to yourself. And then at the end, I'll share some references. Is everybody okay with that? Anybody not okay with it? Okay. So we're going to take a walk in the woods. If you would close your eyes, that would be the best way to do this. Um, and imagine yourself in a beautiful woods that you've always wanted to walk in. And uh, it's the perfect day for you. And you start walking in the woods and you notice there's debris on the ground and you start putting that debris aside as you walk. And then the wind starts to blow. And at first it's a mild wind, but what you, you, you see, you start, you've been thinking about what is it about yourself you really wanna change? You, it's very important to you. It's more important than your comfort. And as the wind blows, you see all your childhood teachings, which are something like, you can't do this any better. You're who you are. You need to be good. You need to listen to what people, all those start flying by as the wind is blowing. And you, you don't get attached to them. You see them. You're watching them. You're seeing them, but they're not sticking to you for some reason. And you keep kicking away this debris and you keep walking and walking and the wind is still blowing, but now it's a breeze and there's no more flying at you. There's nothing flying at you, but there's new thoughts. There's new possibilities that come your way. For example, you could be anything you want. Well, maybe, but that might be one you want, or you're beautiful just the way you are. That could be another one, but whichever one it is, it's something you have not been willing, you just haven't been willing to take on as you, as your own, but you pick one. You just pick one from unlimited options that you see, just unlimited, it could be anything. And you look at that from the point of view of the issue you've been wanting to change most of your life. And you take that in and you listen to what your heart is saying and what your mind is saying. You listen to your heart mind giving you information right now that is a little different than what you've heard before. And you just let it sink in. And there might be other thoughts in your mind, but you don't pay much attention to them. You see them as just thoughts or just feelings or concerns, but you don't pay any attention to them. You just notice them. And then when you're ready, just open your eyes. And if anybody would like to share anything, um, this would be a good time. We still have a few minutes. I can only say it's so personal, but so exciting that I got there. So thank you for that. You did get there. Yeah. Good. And you don't want to share because it's so personal. 
right? That, that's another part about non-duality. Um, and thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. In non-duality, nothing is personal. Nothing is personal. Everything is true for every human being. So, um, for, like, for me, my parents were very abusive. And one of the things they said to me was, you're going to destroy the world. They used to say that to me when they were angry with me. And I, I didn't know what they meant. Of course, I was too young. But I began to be concerned about how powerful I felt. So that was kind of an example. I, when I was powerful, I thought nobody would want to be near me. So, but nothing is personal in the non-dual. Everything is human. Anybody else like to share anything? Sure. <clears throat> oh, if my voice will work. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, I actually decided just a week or two ago, well, I guess it was about a month ago, to uh, do Eckhart Tolle's course on uh, conscious manifestation. And, uh, you know, I, I listened to his books and saw his books 20 years ago. And it just seemed like now was the time to do this again and revisit this stuff. And the getting to that place of quiet um, is a constant practice. It's every moment. It's when I'm in the shower. It's when I'm walking. It's, it's every moment of stopping the ego processing and going into a very, I mean, he talks about it as being being versus doing. Um, and so it's a very, very powerful practice to do. And it helps us become more conscious as human beings. And so I'm just here to say, yay, keep doing this stuff. It's awesome. Um, I think we, and enables us to step more into our power um, as women um, and as human beings. So uh, thumbs up. Thank you, Sherry. Anyone else? Well, I was actually thinking of Eckhart Tolle myself because it brought him to mind when I went into this space. And, uh, you know, what I've discovered from my childhood that has been, I think, a bit destruct destructive in my life is that I became, or I was a puer. Some of you may know that from the men's movement, which meant that my mother thought I was the best thing since sliced bread, and she just wanted me to be perfect, be a doctor, and had all these high expectations for me, and I believed that, and, you know, I achieved in certain ways, and then I found out that all those achievements really didn't mean that much. And what Eckhart Tolle, Tolle taught me, I was concerned when I read about getting into this space, Judith, as you're talking about, because I consider myself a humanitarian, a social justice uh, entrepreneur, but what, what's this all about of just getting to a place where nothing matters? And I found a section in the book that Eckhart, someone asked him that, well, what about all these injustices of the world if we're just in a place of non-thinking and non-reactive? He said, if you are in that place of pure being, or whatever you want to call it, that's where you can address the problems. That's right. That's, that's the only exactly place you can that, you know what, I'm so glad you said that toward the end of my presentation, because that's the truth of it. Non-duality allows one to get to a place where they see solutions that have not been tried before. They see solutions that are shockingly counterintuitive. They're not politically correct. They're just the, the moment's truth of what could possibly happen. So. Thank you for saying that, and thank you all for listening. Now, there's a, oh, here are the, some references, and I'm sure you'll be able to uh, get these if you'd like. I even, I even included my dissertation, which was this year, and it was using this methodology to ameliorate early childhood trauma. And I was an autoethnography, so I used it on myself. So I think I cried every day for at least an hour at least an hour because it really did do the work I wanted to experiment with. So thank you. I think that's it, right? And I'll turn it back to Louise. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Judith. Um, you know, how we, how we approach our fielding work 
and the effect that it can have not only for ourselves, but for everyone that we're doing to share with it. So thank you for that. It was a great experience.